Hi, welcome to Relationship Alchemy. I'm Marie Elizabeth Molly, and today we're going to be talking about the alchemy of change making and relationships. I'm speaking today with George Andriopoulos, who is the award winning founder and CEO of Launchpad 516 a New York-based management consulting firm providing organizations with the tools and resources to innovate and thrive. As both a creative disruptor and a corporate turnaround artist, George inspires change for businesses and individuals stuck in the mindset of defining, defining themselves by their mistakes through his consulting firm, his digital marketing agency, Media Convergence, his company's leadership coaching division, The Leadership Experience, and with his hit leadership podcast, The Launchcast. He's taken his unique experience to the stage as a keynote, motivational, and three-time TEDx speaker, delivering talks that spark inspiration and change. George is also the three-time organizer and executive producer of TEDx Farmingdale, which is how we met because I recently had the amazing good fortune to deliver my own TEDx at TEDx Farmingdale. And I so love the conversations we had through that process. I wanted to invite him on the show. George's mission is to spread ideas and understanding in a world of global turmoil. And this has shifted now to working on focusing with schools in recent years and has a particular focus on bullying prevention and mental health service advocacy. His mission-driven work has become his life's passion and his legacy is simply to be known as a man of service. I'm so excited to bring George to you today. Welcome, George. Thanks for having me, Marie Elizabeth. So you recently made a Facebook post that really inspired me where you talked about all the incredible change making you were doing. It was actually about voting, but you talked about how you put yourself out there and you keep yourself going and you're doing all these things to make a difference. And you're also raising kids and you're married. And I'm wondering, how do you do it all? I'm wondering the same sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's... Um... Leadership has become uh, uh, just a huge theme in my life in these last few years. Um, and, and really, it was always a major part of my life, right, both professionally and personally. And it's only in the last few years that it sort of came to the forefront where I realized that this word leadership sort of means something, uh, whether it's as a coach, whether it's as a business owner, whether it's as a father, a husband, uh, a community member, an activist. Um, and so being a leader, and making sure that I put my time in as a leader and I use all of my resources uh, that are available to me as a leader to create change, it, it's just super important to me. So finding time for it, um, it's often difficult, right? It's a, it's a whole balancing act in, in my life and balance is a huge word in my life as well. You know, really when we look at balance and I, and I talk about this on my coaching platform, the leadership experience, um, the balance phenomenon, right? If you're not out of balance almost every day at a certain point, then you're not in balance, right? And so it's a, it's balance itself is a balancing act. That's the, the very definition of the word. It's back and forth and back and forth and you making a conscious effort to go back the other way. Um, so, you know, some days it works, some days it doesn't. Um, but as long as I keep putting the effort in to make it work as best as possible for my life, then I am, for the most part, staying in balance. I love how you talk about that, because actually in, in my Chinese medicine background, uh, in Chinese medicine, there's always also this drive toward balance within the body. But the theory is that it's the journey of finding balance that is the thing, like you named going this way, going that way, and really seeking it. And the, in Chinese medicine, when you actually hit balance, like if you ever fully get 100% balanced, you actually shortly after will die. <laughs> that that oh. the, the, the experience of being perfectly in balance is not the thing. It's the it's the moving toward balance. It's the effort toward adjusting that is the thing. So I resonated a lot with what you said because it's yeah. an active process. It's not a static state. It's interesting too. It's when you think about it, if you've ever had a and, I, and this just popped into my head, but if you've ever had a loved one that you've lost and have been near 
at the time of losing them. Uh, unfortunately, I've been uh, at way too many bedsides of uh, friends and family being lost. And yeah, there's that moment of clarity yeah. right before. Um, and it's a balance that's kind of found. So that's interesting that, that the Chinese thought that way uh, in terms of finding balance and then, you, and then you die because that balance, that clarity, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to attain on a daily basis. I'm a competitive person. I'm a, uh, competition drives me. And I've, in recent years, I've sort of shifted that to internal competitiveness, right? Mm. Com competing with myself as opposed to other people. I think it's just healthier. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the, the, the journey to the balance, the game in finding balance is very satisfying for me it's very it's fun it, it keeps the days creative and different um uh, so yeah yeah that's 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 my spiel on balance <laughs> yeah so i'm wondering have you noticed your notion of balance and your understanding of leadership and as it relates to your internal life and how you relate to other people how has that evolved over time I heard you say you shifted from competing with others to competing with yourself. Is there another thing that you noticed changing? Yeah, well, it, it, it became healthier, uh, not only for myself, but, but for teaching this to other people, right? When we talk oh. about leadership, um, I do leadership coaching through my company. Through, we have a coaching division, but I also coach executives through the consulting that my consulting firm does. Um, and so in sort of discovering that drive internally with people, I noticed that a lot of times that that drive wound up being competition, just like it is for, for myself. Um, but for me, you know, that external competition competing with others often created unhealthy environments, both in the workplace and, and personally. And, you know, the goal at the end of achieving something became something that I did, you know, long term, I didn't care about, right? It, it was monetary, it was wealth, success in a, in a material form. And so, you know, after going through some really big life-changing moments uh, about 10 years ago in my life, um, that sort of shifted where the goals became different. It was a reset. It was just focusing on the things that mattered in my life, my personal well-being, my family, my relationships with others. Um, and so I sort of took that experience and I brought it to, to the workplace for myself and, and how I teach other people and consult and coach other people. Um, so that, that became such a huge theme for me uh, that it really overtook everything else, taking competition mm -hmm. out of, um, and, and by the way, competition is still healthy. I'm a sports guy. Um, I believe in competition. I would be lying if I said to you that I don't, constantly check numbers on my podcast uh, to make sure that we are competing and that we are ranking in our given categories and things like that. And I, I, I do think that's healthy, but when it becomes like a combative, a combative type of relationship with other people, that's when it sort of gets a little murky, right? So that, that's really the, probably the number one thing that I've changed in terms of how I approach my drive um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I love that nuance because it, it, there can be a tendency to vilify competitiveness, you know, oh, we should all get along and we all need to be, but I, that drive is so important to make things happen and actually have an impact in the world. Yet at the same time, it sounds like you were able to alchemize, my favorite word, alchemize the, the more shadowy sides of it, the unhealthier sides where it goes into this kind of one up, one down you know, constantly comparing yourself against others, which doesn't necessarily push you forward or, or benefit you or your relationships with people, but you can still harness that energy toward making things happen, toward being competitive in the sense of ranking or being excellent. Like to me, the word is, there's a piece around excellence that I feel like you're talking about without having used that word yet. Yeah, there's like my favorite, one of my favorite new words, Marie Elizabeth, is inimitable. Ooh, yeah. Inimitable is one of my favorite new words, and it has everything to do with excellence. It's, and I discovered this word in a, in a really interesting way. And so, you know, when, when the pandemic happened, 
we were sort of not, not transitioning, but we were evolving as a company, right? Launchpad 516, my company has evolved from a straight up management consulting firm to a number of things, marketing agency, now a podcast uh, production company, um, uh, private think tank for, for uh, organizations and, and nonprofits. Um, so we do so many things because I love to just reinvent myself, reinvent my company and keep it going. And so becoming a public speaker years ago and just getting uh, immersed in this world, I met so many coaches in this world, like, like yourself. Um, and I started to learn and understand the coaching business. And, you know, over a number of months, cl close to a year, I was putting together this division where we would do leadership coaching. Um, mm. And then, and then the pandemic hit. And I was like, you know what? No time like the present. Let's pull the trigger now. And so by April of 2020, we launched our first cohort. And it was such a transformative experience to deal with. We worded it as we're taking our coaching to the streets. We always, we always coached in a consulting setting for executives only. Now we're taking it to the streets. Mm. Uh, and so working with these people as individuals and getting intimately involved in, in what leadership means to them in their lives and, and how to help them grow, we would finish these cohorts and everybody wanted more, not only the, the, the clients, but me too, because I'm like, oh my God, I know we've done this and this is so cool, but now what's next? And so inimitable came up organically. And by the way, this coincidentally this was around the time where hamilton was released on uh on disney plus and my oh, wife yes. watched it and then i became obsessed <laughs> not only with with the musical itself but studying it understanding the different perspectives and if you know the song that um leslie odom jr does uh you know as aaron burr called wait for it yep one of the lines is i am inimitable i am an original and that's where I heard the word inimitable. I go, this is the word. This is the word. Not only is his perspective, I could do a whole podcast on Hamilton <laughs> and, and, and understanding Aaron Burr's character and how he's so misunderstood, but inimitable was like, okay, this is the up level. This is excellence in leadership. We don't want to be better than others. We want to be completely unique. From others. We want to be a Great distinction. I'm going to repeat that. We don't want to be better than others. We want to be unique. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so and that requires, requires serious work. alchemy. That requires some serious internal alchemy to, to make that shift. Because I feel like culturally we're taught to constantly compare ourselves to others, you know, and we're not necessarily taught to focus on, well, what is my unique thing and how do I bring that out? the most regardless of what anybody else is doing yeah yeah absolutely tons of alchemy tons, tons of alchemy. yeah so say a bit more about that like what did you have to alchemize yeah and so when when i built this this course it was just about leadership and the definition of leadership and inspiration mm -hmm. understanding the evolution of the concept of inspiration and how to take inspiration and create change with that inspiration. And then you go into other stuff, right? So, you know, you were able to go into the, the add on tracks, which was, you know, for public speakers and activists or writers, there was one for entrepreneurs, one for career leaders, one for podcasters. Um, and so you go, okay, now we need to create something that's an up level. That's not only specific to a, the world that these people live in, you know, whether it's the, their industry or their personal life. Um, but how do they really pinpoint what makes them so different from other people? And how do they take that difference and parallel the word different to the word excellent? Yes. Right? Um, and it's like breaking it apart. It's, it's deconstructing the idea and then reconstructing it with an end goal. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely an alchemist and, and I come from a pharmacy background, by the way, the, the first, half wow. of my career, first half of my career was, uh, was in the pharmacy industry, uh, went to school for pharmacy originally. And that was, um, you know, so, so understanding the way a, a thing right back then was, was a medication is, is constructed and what the mechanisms are for how it helps people. Um, and then understanding how to apply that to a therapy 
was really the foundation of, of the beginning of my career. So now taking that into the business world, into the leadership world, into the every world that I'm a part of, um, and being able to apply that to the, the therapy, quote unquote, of, yeah. of what I am trying to do in that very moment, uh, it takes a little bit of a formula. It takes a little bit of, you know, add this, add that, um, take this away, take that away, and, and just finding that perfect formula for yourself to create success. I love that. I had no idea you had a pharmacy background. That's amazing. Yeah. So how is that? I'd love to turn and talk a bit about specifically about relationship alchemy and how has all this amazing work you've been doing in the world intersected with your relationship with your family life, with raising kids, like how have you found a way to look for balance there? Yeah, it's it's the basis of all of it, Marie Elizabeth. Um, it's ten years ago. I was in the I was still in the pharmacy industry. Um, I had grown to a level of success in my career that I never could have imagined, and the ego that came with that because of a lot of things, because of the professional environment that I came up in, because of my mindset, because of my ideals of success and what that meant in real life, it really turned me into an asshole, to be honest. <laughs> um, I was one of the biggest assholes that I had ever met <laughs> you know, <not laughs> for other people. Um, but th that ego had grown to a place where I just stopped understanding that I was living in a world with other people and that my mm -hmm. choices, um, my successes, my losses, they affected other people in a big way and how I treated other people affected our relationships and their viewpoints of, of me and, and those around me. Um, and so it all came crashing down. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, I had a failed marriage. Uh, I had two little kids at home um, career ruin. And wow. I was left with nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. 2011, I, I, I remember specifically from the period of August, 2011 till, uh, you know, end of 2011 was probably the worst time in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so once I sort of grieved that moment and, and felt sorry for myself, um, and got past that, and realize that I can't go on like this. I need to, something's got to change, George. You have to look, you have to look inwards and really understand what you created here. Oh, what and, a great, what a great question. Like what a great yeah. point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I didn't have the answer to be honest with you at the time. The only answer was you have to rebuild and it starts with your kids. So now, mm -hmm. you know, divorced dad, right? Single dad time. Um, and you go, well, all right, goal one is just, I need to be there for my kids in every way that I can be. I want to be the divorced dad whose kids don't feel like they're children of divorce. Mm -hmm. um, and so that became my life. It took time off of work, a lot of time off of work and just focused on my kids. Um, and that grew into focusing on my interpersonal relationships with others, friends, family, um, and then focusing on my personal relationships uh, and organically developing this relationship with my now wife, um, Colleen, and uh, growing as a team, being there for each other's successes and, and, and failures and um, just being supportive, knowing that my goals aren't the end all be all of our relationship. It's our goals that are the end all be all of our relationship. Um, and even then they're not the end all be all right. Cause goals not realized don't mean that you're failing at a relationship. And so I love well, that you said that. Yeah. 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 There's, there's the present piece of how, how do I be fulfilled and nourished and, and grateful for what's here. And at the same time, recognize that there's places I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and as this is all building, it's like I'm, I'm really starting to feel good as a person again because other things sunk in that I, I never knew about before. I didn't know what depression was. I had never mm -hmm. experienced um, emotions on the spectrum of emotions. I experienced, you know, happiness and anger. Those were my two <laughs> emotions before. And mm -hmm. um, 
and at, at, at big extremes. And so, you know, this whole process of just being single, being a single dad and whatever, it brought about a lot of emotions and feelings. And I had to really experience those and not understand them until later to go look back and go, oh my God, that was like a year of depression there. And I had no idea I was in it. Um, and then everything's sort of firing on all cylinders on the personal side of things. And you kind of know that you're on your way. Like you think I'm on the right path here, but there's something missing. I felt like 80% of a human being. Mm. And what was missing was my professional life. But you have to understand that for me, success in my professional life I mean, and this is due to trauma, the trauma of everything that had happened 10 years ago that I had caused. Yeah. Success in my professional life equaled trauma, equaled all the bad things that happened. Exactly. I, I can totally see that. And, and there, um, I imagine there might have been a fear of, of, oh, if I go really hard again, I'm going to recreate that collapse. Correct. That's exactly the fear. That's exactly like I always envision him as another person. And I go, mm. I don't ever want to see him again. Right. And I go hard again because you know what? Damn it. Sometimes you have to say, I know I'm good at what I do. And I know that when I put my mind to something, I'm going to be successful. I never lost that even through like the lows. I knew that about myself. I know that I'm a special person in that way. But, and I'm not saying that in a, in a, a, a boasting kind of way. It's just something innate that I, I know that I'm inimitable. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah how to go about that. Well, that's, that's the trick, right? That that's, right. that's the thing that I didn't know because I was bad at that part of it. Right. So, you know, I started getting out there sort of consulting um, because I was, I was good at turning around a broken business and I wanted to shift to a different industry. And I said, all right, let me, let me start shifting now. Let me, I've always had consulting as a goal of mine, even since way back early in my pharmacy days, let me, let me sort of shift and see if I can do this on a very simple level. And I did it independently. And then it started working. And then I go, you know what? I think the best thing right now for me is to start my own small business, do this as a self-employed person and build my life professionally around my personal life. Build this company. In oh, a you're speaking that- my language. Yeah build this company in a way that I can be the class dad. I can go on every field trip. I can take the kids whenever I possibly can. Um, I have time for my significant other and, and things that are important to me, um, you know, as a human being, and then just see where the business goes. And that choice was everything because here we are, I started this company in 2013. And here we are eight years later and it worked. Mm. Um, and it worked organically because I didn't force it. Um, every meeting that was a, a conflict with something going on with the kids, I did not take that meeting. Wow. But as I grew as a dad and, and became a husband and now I'm a, a new dad again, I have a 15 month old little girl. Congrats. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, as that grew, and I started dealing with some of the past trauma professionally, I kind of realized that, okay, I don't have to feel guilty forever here. Like I can, I need to let some of this go in order to grow professionally too. Mm -hmm. My kids, they know that I'm there for everything. They have two parents, both myself and their mother, like that are there for it everything like everything i don't know married mm-hmm. couples that can do that let alone right that. right horse couples everything yeah. we are there for and you go okay i have a potentially life-changing meeting friday afternoon but i had the movies planned with the kids and then you talk to the kids and they go well, we'll just go two hours later dad it's no big deal just go to your meeting and then you go okay i can start reshifting i could start mm-hmm. shifting priorities again and it's a, it's a constant balancing act and there are times where i need to pull back i remember mm-hmm. specifically one of the best examples was i was a newlywed again it was three years ago uh before the pandemic hit i i i'm a public speaker and i typically don't like to travel throughout the year i'll travel in the springtime and in the fall time the two big like uh conference seasons right 
Uh, and I'll book a couple of weeks of travel in each and, and bang out a few speaking engagements and, and call it a day. And everything else is local here in, in the tri-state area. Mm. And the fall time typically for me is very busy anyway. School starts again. I'm so involved in my kid's school and, and other things and whatever. So and, and my business gets busy. And I remember coming home to my wife and going, okay, this is great. I booked two weeks of, of speaking engagements all around like the Eastern seaboard and we're going to travel and da, 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 And I got this and I got that. And she goes, Hey, you know how you're always talking about work-life balance in your coaching and your business. And I go, yeah. And she goes, you're not doing a very good job of it right now. And I go, mm-hmm. okay, point taken. And, and it took a little time off. I took my wife with me on my, on my speaking engagement trip and we made a trip out of it. And that's the whole thing. It's just, listening and understanding and actively shifting when you need to shift and just maintaining that balance. And I am not a master at this, Maria Elizabeth. I have not figured it out yet, but I try as hard as I can every day. And that's the best I can do. That's the best any of us can do. And I'm I'm hearing in what you're saying, both sides of it, you know, that the importance of her speaking up and being a mirror for, hey, there's something that feel, that's out of integrity here with how you want to live and I want to be with you. And then you being open to hearing that and actually making a shift. And yeah. both of those are so important because if either one doesn't happen, if she just got resentful and quiet and didn't say anything, that would begin to create distance. Or if you just rejected, no, this is what I want to do. And you didn't take in her feedback, that would begin to create distance, right? That's so the, the, the both and of her speaking up and you're being willing to make an adjustment is really beautiful to witness. That's, that's how you do it. Trying. I'm trying. <laughs> so trying my best. Do you, do you and, and Colleen have any kind of regular uh, practice might be too formal a word. Is there like a check-in? How, how do you stay current with the balance question? Um, no, we don't have a formal check-in we 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 try and keep it organic just for us it's for us it's really this thing of like if we don't want to try too hard because then if we're if we're trying unless something's wrong right but if you're trying too hard for us then this isn't for for any other couple for us because we're we're inimitable as a couple right (laughs) we're unique for us we when we feel like we're trying too hard, that might be a sign of, all right, we need to refocus here and just spend time alone. We happen to be a couple that works really well in close proximity. So mm-hmm. like the pandemic, aside from some, you know, sad stuff that had happened within our family due to the pandemic, um, the pandemic was a great time for us as a family. I mean, her entire pregnancy with our daughter, Joanna was home. Mm-hmm. Um, we got to spend the first year of Joanna's life with her every single day. Wow. Uh, and it's funny because I'm with my two older ones. I am I was a more than present dad and I'm there for everything. But even when they were little before I was divorced, you know, it's this thing of like um, when, when the baby gets hurt, when the baby falls down, when the baby's upset, baby always wants mommy. And yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it's nature, right? And you don't take offense to it because you realize that's just how parenting works. But with this one, although she still will favor mommy, um, if it comes down to it, if you really, really put a gun to her head and ask her. But (laughs) with this one, if she fell down, if she got hurt, if she was upset at something, it's whichever parent was closer, she's fine with going to them. And as a, as a dad, just because we talk about relationship constructs and what it means to be a dad, what it means to be a mom and the, the norm, right? The quote unquote norm. Yeah. Um, you look at the norm, the expected norm, and it's really cool to have been a sort of stay at home dad yeah. this past year of her life and to have that innate thing where she would come to me as a reflex and you're like, oh man. This is dare. I never had this before, you know. Yes. I mean, you're breaking that old paradigm in such a beautiful way. And she gets to have the imprint of a man who's there. Right. Right. And so her relationships will be forever different. Right. A daughter who grew up with an, you know, with a father who was gone 12 hours a day at work or 10 hours a day or that kind of thing. So, oh, I love that you brought that in. It's so, 
And that's really, to me, a lot of what relationship alchemy is about as a, as a brand, as a movement, you know, is really about how do we break out of these constructs, these old roles that have defined us and actually discover what is true relationship and what is just how do we be with each other as whole people, less defined by the old archetypes. Yeah, so, those, and those archetypes, they don't really serve us anymore because when we stick to, and this transcends too, you know, the, one of the biggest secret to what I do for a living as a, a, a turnaround artist, as a, a corporate business consultant, whatever you want to call me, is that there is no secret. Just take away all of the stuff that you think is how it's supposed to be in your head and just do the damn thing. Amen. Right? Like if you just do it without thinking, you know how it's supposed to be done, you're going to figure out how it works best. It's very hard for us as human beings to separate what's best and what I know how to do. Yes. My role as a business consultant, when I come into a company, I'll leave and, and you're getting pre I'm getting praise. Like, Oh my God, I, you're a genius. How did you think? Of I'm not saying this to be boastful because I'll turn around and go, what? I didn't do anything. I didn't do any. I just literally opened up lines of communication and I'll point out people in the company. I go, he did it. She did it. This yeah. person, she, who you've never asked for advice before that has been working for you for eight years. She came up with the thing that fixed your company. I just mm -hmm. asked her. That's what I did, you know, yeah. but you never thought to ask her because tradition says, or the company model says, or historical data says that these positions are the leadership positions that need to dictate how this company runs. Amazing. Break the rules, alchemize. Break the rules, alchemize, exactly. And, and that takes a certain kind of presence and listening that it sounds like you've cultivated through your own sort of death and reawakening, so to speak, you know, through your own demise 10 years ago and that reconstruction that you had to do to come back a more connectable, humble, well-rounded person. Yeah. That's actually what people need, right? So you're bringing that whole person into a company that hasn't done that work yet, say, and by asking the questions you ask, it, it feels like then you can begin to open that up for them too, of, well, you know, thinking beyond the old archetypes, getting out of the box. Leadership happens in many, fa you know, facets, in many forms. And it's, it sounds like asking the right questions is part of the key. Oh, totally. It's, I have learned, I ask one thing of people, it's learn from your mistakes and learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. Um, that's what's going to teach us how to break those archetypes. I thought I knew how to do it the first time around. Guess what? I didn't know shit. Me too. Apparently, <laughs> apparently yeah. you know. <laughs> yep. Ditto. I mean, I, I thought I knew how to be married. Nope. Didn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So is there, uh, I'd like to, I always ask this question toward the end. Is there a, a favorite book that's helped you uh, either in your relationship or in your work? That's really been a pivotal book yeah, so, so there's a few books. Something that I read really early on in the start of my company was a book called How to Be a Fierce Competitor by Jeffrey Fox. Really short read, it's like, a, like a coffee table read. Um, and it's just principles of being a fierce competitor without sort of getting into that super competitive state, right? That unhealthy state. Uh, I think the, the, the subtitle on it is what winning companies and great managers do in tough times. So it's more of a, like a strategy kind of thing. Uh, but there have been so many books over the last few years that have been become so important to me. Um, you know, when you look at anything, I, I've read uh, a book called uh, Talk Like Ted by Carmine Gallo, which is when I got into my TED journey. Um, it was super important to me, not only being a, a TEDx speaker, but being a TEDx uh, producer, executive producer of, of my own TEDx event. Um, and it sort of showed me how, because I also read Chris Anderson's book. Uh, yeah. And and no offense to Chris Anderson, but I fell asleep 85 times during Chris <laughs> Anderson's book. And then I read Carmine Gallo's book and I'm like, this is what it's about. And even as, as an organizer of an event, that kind of showed me like every organizer has a different look 
as a different viewpoint of what their event should be about. And that's what makes TEDx as a brand so diverse, right? It's different people yeah. putting on different events all mm-hmm. sort of coming together. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, my newest passion, podcasting for the last few years, my, my communications hero is Howard Stern. And, and oh. Howard Stern today, not Howard Stern 30 years ago with the strippers and everything. Right, right. <laughs> Howard Stern today is one of the best interviewers on the planet, which is why 30 years ago he was interviewing strippers and and today he's interviewing, you know, Billy Joel and and uh, Ed Sheeran and, and Hillary Clinton and, and mm-hmm. all these huge like game changers. Um, so his book, uh, Howard Stern Comes Again, is was an incredible look into um, his different interviews, his biggest interviews and how he sort of weaved the storytelling in those interviews. And he's had a direct impact on how I put together my interviews on the launch cast. So oh, fascinating. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So what's the best way I'm going to put uh, all the links to connect with George in the show notes, but I'm wondering, you know, if you want to say real quick, what's the best way to connect with you if someone's interested in learning more about your work and possibly working with you? Yeah. So let's just have a conversation. Just shoot me a, a DM on, you know, either Facebook or Instagram or Twitter at launchpad CEO at launchpad CEO and uh, find me on one of those platforms and DM me and, and we can figure out all the other stuff. There's too, too many websites and too many uh, <laughs> emails to list here. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I love how prolific your creativity is. It's amazing. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here today. And and I want to thank you again for having me be a part also of your TEDx show, you know, this year. It just was a transformative experience for me and especially the way you held it. That's also why I wanted to have this conversation because just the way you held us as speakers and created a sense of community and really invited us to step into something larger for ourselves had me really want to bring you to my audience. So thanks. Oh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. you were a pleasure to work with. And uh, I love, I absolutely loved your TEDx talk. It was so, so good. And again, so important to get out there on the stage. So thank you for having me. And, and it was a pleasure having you on our stage. Thank you so much.